Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Wild Hearts at Work podcast. I am your host, Melissa Boggs, and our phrase this week is bias disruption. Dun, dun, dun. I'm going to say it again because this one's a big one. Bias disruption. And my guest this week has been doing a lot of really cool things in her company to do just that. And I am really excited to invite to the podcast Tiffany Ferris, who is the CEO of Palantir.net. Tiffany, hello. Welcome. Hi, Melissa. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, I can't wait to tell the world what you've been doing. Uh, start by just introducing yourself to our listeners. Tell us about you. Tell us about Palantir.net. Thank you. Thank you. So I, as you said, I'm, I'm the CEO of um, Palantir.net, and we are a digital consultancy, much like, you know, um, any firm of our age. Uh, we're, we've been around now for over 25 years. Um, we have done almost all the things, right? We had our own CMS for a while, and then we eventually stumbled on open source. Um, so we've been uh, very involved in the Drupal content management system. And so I have been a, a board member um, of the Drupal Association for longer than I um, I care to, <laughs> to share <laughs> at that point. But, you know, at Palantir, we, um, we really like solving gnarly complex problems. And we tend to work with really large institutional nonprofits, um, technology companies, and public sector um, clients. And we use those open source tools to help them think through and solve really those those larger problems. And, and they're not technology problems that we help them solve. We help them solve the the, the business problems or the, the, the you know, that the, the they have. Um, and through that work, really, my current focus is, is around using um, and, and helping teams create really sustainable, agile environments. Um, and um, and to do so in very sustainable ways, um, and and for those teams to become high performing, I think it, it's important that they um, that they be diverse, right? In order for us to come up with the best solutions, we need to be able to to create environments where um, all the solutions can be brought to the table, and, and lots of different ways of of thinking, and lots of different like experiences and perspectives um, can come together and work in really productive ways together. I already hear bias disruption sneaking into your narrative already. Um, but I have to say, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to have you here on the podcast is you, you talked about gnarly complex problems for your clients. But I happen to know that you also are tackling some really gnarly complex problems for your own team. Mm -hmm. and, and the types of problems that we talk about tackling in the world. Um, <laughs> but you have found some ways to actually tackle them, or at least to experiment around it. Um, right. So for instance, um, if I recall correctly, you have somewhat of a, shall we say, wild-hearted, haha, uh, organizational, I, I know, right? I'm so good, I'm so sneaky. Um, a bit of a wild organizational structure, right? You don't have like the typical director, manager, et cetera. Do you wanna tell people about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think one of the questions that we asked ourselves a few years ago was how do, how might we, how might we build a, an organization, uh, a really people-centered organization that wasn't dependent on any one person, myself included, um, or um, my other owner who happens to be my husband, right? It's particularly if you've done this for a really long time, there is a, um, there's a risk that you run that it becomes about you, about your skills. And any of us, um, we have blind spots and we have um, things we're good at, things we're not good at, and ways in which we experience the world and ways in which we see the world, right? And, and that can become very limiting, limiting to you, limiting to others, and limiting to uh, your company and limiting to your clients. And so, you know, when we started at, at that, we were like, well, you know, um, how might we create an environment where it um, being people centered, really focusing on what each of us brings to the party um, doesn't, doesn't become that kind of albatross, right? Doesn't become something that locks us in to, to doing that. How do we celebrate the, the strengths that you bring without 
having those strengths become toxic through overuse um, or having that strength that, that I might have um, become the pattern that everyone else has to follow, right? If my shoe becomes <laughs> becomes the, the mold that everyone else has to kind of fit their foot into, it's not going to fit for Boring. everyone. Boring. Yeah, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, right? But we all do that, right? We all kind of get in our minds this, um, this image of, oh, well, this is what a project manager does, or this is what a consultant does, or this is what a that does, because that's, that's what humans do, right? We're so good at pattern recognition and pattern matching that we see it even when it isn't there. So if we come back to this question, which is like, how do you build this company? that is fundamentally about people and recognizes and centers people and their experiences, but isn't about any one of us. We wanna build this system, we wanna think about it structurally and build it so that each of us can grow and nurture our strengths, um, but recognizes that the strengths that each of us have are different and recognizes that the ways in which I'm gonna grow are the ways in which I'm going to grow best is going to be tailored to the things that I'm one good at and two interested in. Right. And then also that there are multiple ways to be good at any given role in a company. So how do you do all of those things, but still have it actually be somewhat equitable? How do you even get your arms around that and have it not um, not be total chaos. So that was really my challenge. I'm very curious about how you could create a system that still fulfilled that fundamental, um, those fundamental expectations of any community. Um, so when, when, you know, we enter a community, we want to know what's expected of us. We want to know what we can expect from that community. And we want to know how that's going to be governed. So how I'm going to be rewarded, how it's going to be enforced, all of those things. So when you're thinking about um, your career and what company you trust it to, um, you want to know, how do I get a promotion if there's no right way to be a project manager? Or um, if I'm at a company that's really small, how do I grow here? Um, so those are all the things that we were thinking about. So, um, yeah. Really quick before you go into how you solve the problem, I just want to call out three different assumptions slash biases that I think I heard there that basically you were trying to challenge, which I love. Um, one, I will call it, I'm making this up, but I will call it like the queen bee bias that there has to be you know, this single person. And in your case, because you are a strong woman CEO, we'll call it the queen bee assumption. So you yourself were challenging that assumption, which I love so much. Um, the second one is, I don't have a catchy name for it yet, but the idea that you can't serve the employee and still hit your business goals. And we like to pretend like we don't assume that, but the minute that you start centering the employee in, in, a, in an organization, they start to go, well, whoa, 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 hold on, whoa, whoa. But we still have a business to run. And what I hear you doing is challenging. Of course we do. That's a given. But our assumption is that serving the employee is going to serve those business goals. And then the third one is that, and you said this one pretty explicitly, but that even just any role can be cookie cutter. Not only is the leader role not cookie cutter, but none of them are. And so you're kind of like challenging them at all angles here, my friend, and I cannot wait to hear how you solve them all, or at least are trying. Yeah, I would say we're trying. I mean, it's all a constant experiment. So yeah, I, I don't, um, I think it's right. I, I don't, I don't queen bee very well, or like, a, you know, I, I've said before, I'm not I don't, I don't fit the girl boss very well. Um, so it's, <laughs> it's just not me. It never has been. There've been many people who've come expecting that and, and gone away very disappointed. Um, you know, particularly if you only, if you only meet me in conferences or in talks, it's not, 
you know, the reality is not the same. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that that what's important to keep in mind is that we do come from an abundance mindset, that it isn't a zero sum game. And fundamental to the model that we have is the, that it is a positive sum game that inherent in what the way that we've we've solved this, which we call our role based structure, is that each person, by demonstrating their own agency, ends up adding to the capacity of the firm. And as you level up your skills, what we're able to do and what we're able to, the value we're able to deliver for our clients increases. So the more value we're able to deliver, the better our bottom line gets. And it was incredibly radical. The team was so concerned, but also they know then, and they do trust at the end of the day that I'm such a numbers girl. That is one thing you must know about me, um, that I am so good at the financial model. That is my, that's my jam. And, um, and it has, it has proven out, right? So when we decoupled this notion that, Hey, I'm, I'm going to set aside this this pool of, of promotions for this year, or this pool of raises for this year. Um, and I'm just going to let people advance as they advance. Um, everyone was like, how is that going to work? And I said, we'll find out. We'll run an experiment. We'll see how it goes. And we'll, we'll uh, demonstrate it. But so far, it's been amazing. Um, and, and the way that we did it is we, we sat down and we said, for each of the disciplines that we have, um, we set aside five different levels. And we said, you know, it, which span from um, a learner all the way up through an innovator. Um, and I, I suppose there's also, I don't even, right? There's, I guess there's a level zero, which is like, nope, can't even, or not yet, really, <laughs> um, is what it is, right? And for each of the disciplines at, at Palantir, there are um, skills definitions for what skills we think go into it. And from the agile mindset, each of our skill definitions are T-shaped. So there are some that we think that you have to have just to be a palantiri, right? Just to be, um, a, a, you know, a solid consultant and to work in the kind of, of work that we do. But some are very discipline specific and they go to the depth of the work that, that you do um, and, you know, for, you know, on your project teams. So we really do have cross-functional project teams. So there's always the opportunity to grow and cross-train and things like that. And so we defined all of these um, in, in a rubric. And, um, and then what happens is you go into the RBS and you self-level. You say, oh, okay, I am in, in this one. You know, I'm, I think I'm a, a two or a three. And if I'm a three, I should be able to give examples. Not if, like, it's not an assessment of what I'm capable of. It's an assessment of what I have done. And I should be able to give examples in the last six months of how I have demonstrated that at Palantir. And then I have um, a couple of pod members and they're not your supervisors, but they are two peers that each have a lens that they use to help coach and advise you. One has a lens from the company's perspective and one has a lens on your experience on your project teams. And so they're each, they're bringing that perspective about with the company perspective of what are the opportunities that might exist here that, that I might be thinking about or not yet thinking about for growth or for other opportunities here. And then the experience wrap is you know, what am I actually doing on projects or, um, you know, what might I need help with or, or coaching with, or just a person to talk with about what that experience is like. So um, they also um, are going to level you. Um, and based on their experience and others' experiences of you. And it becomes this conversation. So I'm leveling myself, others are leveling me, and then we have a conversation. And every every level then um, you rationalize it and you say, oh, okay, you come together and you say, this is, this is where I think I am. They say, well, this is what we've experienced of you. And um, we've been doing this now for, gosh, um, about a year and a half. It rolled out November of, gosh, before times. Um, <laughs> November of 2020. Yeah. Um, what so is, what is time? It's okay. I, I don't even remember time anymore. Um, <laughs> but we've gone through an entire um, promotion cycle now. Um, so then you, 
um, you have it as a conversation and everyone kind of sits down and, and agrees. And, and if you've leveled up, if, it, if, if I was a level six and now I'm a level seven, then huzzah, right? Um, what then happens is you sit down and you write a growth log and you say, oh, hey, these are the ways in which I've grown um, since my last promotion and your pod reps are like, this is what we've experienced. And they reflect it back to you. These are the ways we've, we've seen you grow. And, um, and then we have a celebration and it's for the whole company and everybody is invited and it's recorded and it's a half hour of just celebrating you and your growth and all those cool things. Um, and that's how we rolled it out to everybody because it was the first time. And now that everybody kind of is leveled, um, each person has an individual learning plan that they set out and say, Hey, I know where I am, but I know where I'm going. And this is, this is what I want to work on. This is how I want to grow. This is how I'm going to use my, my prof dev time and my prof dev money, which everybody has that's discretionary to them. And, and then they're upfront about it. When you charter on your projects, you can say, this is, this is an area that I'm working on. I, I might like feedback specifically in this area. It would be helpful for me if I could, if I could work on things like this. Um, it supports my ILP. Um, because as you may, you know, probably know, it's you're more open to feedback in areas where you're specifically like looking for it, and it's more meaningful in those in those areas. Yeah, for sure. So I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, so, what are the what are the top, say, two or three things that if if someone were to ask you, you know, maybe an old boss of yours from way back when we're to say like, what are the top two or three things that are different about this than a traditional, I'm using air quotes here, uh, company or traditional development structure? So I've never worked anywhere else. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so, but I'll guess. Um, so we have, um, the salaries are leveled um, and it's not a range. It is a salary. So all level, we believe in equal pay for equal responsibilities. So there is a level five, there is a level six, and those increment every year at the same time for every person. Um, Which also means that pay is, pay is transparent if I'm connecting the dots because people know what level you are and what that level pays. Am I getting that right? You know, I would have thought, um, and that's one of the things that's been most surprising to me is that there isn't yet a comfort level with knowing what level each person is. So oh, okay. They, so you, they, they have not, the team has not been comfortable with like sharing what level everybody is. So you know what every level makes. So there's salary transparency in that, from that respect, but each person um, has chosen to keep their level private. Okay. Okay. But we still have equity and mm -hmm. we have, an understanding of how you get to X level, X level. And, and what that level pays. Um, yeah. What else is different? There can be as many level whatever's as need be. So my advancement isn't dependent on a seat opening up. So it really is this difference between that scarcity mindset and that abundance mindset. There can be as many, directors or managers or principals or architects or whatever. And, and that's really been our experience. Um, and what I have been thrilled about is that in our, since we've rolled it out, the folks who've put themselves forward um, for promotion have matched what we would have expected statistically for the company. Nice. Right? So when but you they... go to look at the numbers, you would just, you know, so we didn't, we didn't, we don't push anybody, right? It's, it's, I have to put myself forward and I have to say, oh, I'm ready to, I'm ready to be leveled. I want to move forward um, It on gender, um, on every one of our metrics. Because Palantir is a, a gender balanced company at every level and across every discipline. And, um, and we have a ways to go in terms of our, um, our racial division. We do better than most firms in tech, but it's still something, it's an area of growth for us. Um, but, but across all the metrics, um, the level of promotions matches what we would expect it to, to match statistically. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. 
So you kind of are alluding to maybe something that you may have been afraid of. And that's, that's a question I want to ask you. So having been in your shoes to do some pretty radical things at a company, I know that sometimes the night before you're going to do something like this, you've got the butterflies. <laughs> uh, as a leader about to do something maybe a little crazy, um, what were a couple of the things that you were afraid of and did they come to fruition at all? I was, I was a little bit nervous that, um, that the numbers might not work. I mean, I'd modeled it six ways from Sunday and said, you know, I really do think this is going to, this is going to work. Um, I was worried about, um, I, you know, I, I was worried that the salary transparency would, you know, would make it somehow, a disincentive. Um, and I don't, I haven't seen that. Um, I think that folks kind of get it when they come in and it feels really good. I, I worried about it in recruiting. Um, I, it's been actually really freeing in recruiting as I, we're very upfront, like from the minute someone applies for the position, we're like, this is our, this is our level system. It's not a range. It's not secret. We're upfront about it. it. Makes a lot of those conversations a lot easier. This is what we pay. This is what we, these are the responsibilities this role has. This is um, where it fits in. This is, and when someone does come in, we say we're going to use, we're going to operate from a place of positive intent. We're going to take what you think your salary should be, um, where you know where you think you're coming in, and we're going to hold you to those those expectations. And um, and if you overperform them, within six months you automatically get leveled, even without an ILP. So we automatically figure out where you go. So if we get it wrong. We're going to correct. It's a self-correcting system um, in that way, um, and and it's really been, it, it, you know, it's, it's been really kind of beautiful in that way. I think a lot of people um, are very concerned about if you don't have supervisors, what happens to performance concerns, um, and you know, it, it could be that we just didn't do them right. But I, I don't know anyone who's ever shared with me either as a leader or as someone who's been through a PIP or, you know, other kind of performance improvement plan that that has ever been a positive experience for them um, and ever worked out or been great. Um, so I just, um, I remain very skeptical that we're missing out on something by, by not taking a growth mindset to the way that we do um, advancement and um, and growth and at Palantir, but I'm, I can be wrong. I, you know, but it's just been, I think it's a, a question about holding people to those expectations and setting accountability structures, um, within the team. Like, you know, th these are the expectations we have of you. And then if someone's unable to meet those, I, I think in a system where they're clear, I think most people want to meet the things that they're expected to do. And if that, is an uncomfortable position, then we can have a conversation about what that looks like to separate, but it can be done in a, a human kind of way rather than a adversarial way. It's just different. Absolutely. And I, for non hierarchical structures like that, um, I think that's the number one, I'm kind of repeating what you said, but I just want to highlight it again. It's the number one thing that people seem to assume. It's almost like, it's like a, embodiment of scarcity versus abundance in the sense that if you don't have someone over your head, you're not going to perform. And to me, that's like this, the scarcity portion of it where taking the perspective that everyone gets up in the morning and wants to do well and wants to do well by the company. And you have in place a way that allows them to do that. And frankly, Often in traditional structures, then the, the manager is the one taking the credit for it anyway, <laughs> you know, and this is allowing your folks to, to take credit for the work that they're doing. Um, but with that, with great power comes great responsibility, Spider-Man. Okay. Um, and, you know, they're also deeply accountable is what I'm hearing you say. Right. And I think that's a, it's a big difference, right? There's no hiding it's very obvious if 
there's a mismatch or if it's not working. And I think that's um, can be uncomfortable. Um, and so I think that's a, it, it is, it's just a very different kind of way of working. Um, and we're so used to, we're so conditioned to expect that there is a, a layer of people um, whose sole job or whose primary job is to align other people into their work, right? Um, but, and I don't, I don't really know anyone who is like, oh yeah, I need someone to tell me what to do, that, that people are fundamentally, that I am a fundamentally lazy person and without someone to tell me what to do, I wouldn't do it. Um, and yet that's exactly how many of our structures are organized. Um, is around this notion that, you know, people wouldn't work if we didn't force them to work. And I just, I don't buy into that. Agreed. And I think you were ahead of, you know, your ideas were ahead of the pandemic that sort of proved that like mm -hmm. you can't, you can no longer write that story about everyone. Now you may have specific people in your organization that you're struggling with, they may just have lack of clarity. There could be all kinds of reasons why people are not performing. But I don't think that any longer leadership in any company can get away with writing the story in their own head and then putting policies in place that say what you just said. You know, like they won't work if we don't look over their shoulder because we all did it for two years and many of us are still doing it. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think we've now been forced to face that. I'm curious, you've mentioned a couple, but what are the other things? So you had some things that you were afraid of that did not seem to come to fruition. Amazing. Love it. Which by the way, leaders note that so many times the things that we are afraid of when we are going to do something different, do not come to fruition. Um, on the flip side, what are some things that you didn't count on that are beautiful that you're like, oh, I didn't plan for that, but that was really cool. I really love these celebrations that happen. Um, and initially I thought, okay, well, part of the bias disruption is about um, disrupting the power structures and um, about it being, uh, you know, that when someone um, levels up, that we wanted it to be this kind of capstone experience of, hey, I'm reflecting on um, on how I've grown, right? So we're like, okay, well, it needs to be this kind of moment of self-awareness and moment of celebration. And I thought, well, maybe, I'm not sure if anybody's going to come, but we really want it to be public and not just about who would show up. So, um, so George shows up and I show up and the chief of staff shows up and I thought, you know, Let's just make it open, and um, but you know we'll we'll show up, and um, we'll see if others show up too. And um, they've turned into these beautiful kind of like joyous celebrations, and people make uh, like um, we've had folks who who someone made um, like a JavaScript like Mario level to demonstrate how they were like um, it just taught themselves. Uh, you know, something new or, you know, somebody else, they just shared so much of their personal life or their personal story or their personal journey in that moment. Um, and if you're not on their project team, you might not get to see that side of them. Um, and it just was this really poignant moment. And they were able to talk about how um, being at Palantir was, was part of that journey for them. And um, it was this really unexpected piece of it. We didn't know what to expect um, from those, but it was just kind of this moment of, well, let's take a minute and and allow this person to own the fact that, that they um, chose to do this, right? It's about the agency and really flipping the script from what the experience had been at Palantir for the previous, you know, 22, 23 years, which was, you know, someone said, oh, I think you've been doing a good job. So you got a promotion. Good job. You know, like at whatever that quarterly review was. And it was like, oh, I saw this of you. I saw this of you. I saw this of you. When you flip that script and it's like, hey, this is where I started and this is where I am now. And this has been my journey here. And this is what it means to me. It's incredibly powerful um, and, in, and just very meaningful. And it they just, and then to have your colleagues show up and witness that, and then to see you and to say, 
here's how I've experienced you and here's how you've shown up for me on our, on our project work together and here's what it's meant. It's far, far exceeded anything I could have imagined. I'm also kind of imagining having never attended one that it, it becomes like a celebration of the team in addition to a celebration of that individual person. Cause I can imagine I could be wrong that that person is also kind of demonstrating gratitude, you know, to their, maybe their pod leader or the people on their team that helped them to develop in these ways. And so suddenly now it's like, primarily it is still, you know, a celebration of that person, but it becomes sort of a celebration of Palantir for the moment, which sounds really beautiful. Can I come? Yeah. <laughs> come on. They're really, they're actually really great. I mean, they, um, because we rolled these out in the middle of the, the pandemic and, you know, many of us hadn't, you know, weren't around other people. They filled this amazing need for celebration that we just hadn't had. Um, and so they really filled a hole that I think many of us didn't realize that was there. Um, you know, usually we, in the before times, we had, you know, an annual retreat when we would all get together. And such a big part of our culture, such a big part of our brand is the plus plus. So we have a culture in our Slack and have had for, you know, even before we use Slack, but back when IRC days, you know, we would have the plus plus where we would just increment if somebody had done something really well and show gratitude or appreciation or recognition that way. And so we do that at our all companies. We do that in Slack. We do that in lots of different places, like on our you know, stickers and t-shirts and all that kind of thing, but it just, it carries forward into that moment. I mean, even, even on our little, I've got a little pin here, right? This is, this is our plus plus. And it, it just becomes that moment, that extension of that plus plus for that person. But then the person gets to pay that forward to the people who help them get to that moment and the people who, um, whether they're, you know, Palantir alums or, or their colleagues still, um, there are so many people who help us get to those moments of, of achievement. And I think it's nice to have that ceremony and uh, to market for ourselves. And so it's, it's a, such an, an unexpected moment um, or, or, you know, just to have that ritual be part of, of what we do. You know, it's, it's even if, you know, I think in the before times, you know, before we implemented this RBS system, there might be a, if your title changed, there might be an email that went out to celebrate you, you know, and it would go up on the website. Yay. You know what I mean? <laughs> this is just a very different, very different feeling. Sure. And how often did you say they are on a cycle or, well, they're not because they're kind of self. So how often do you think these happen? Like every quarter, anybody who wants to, to do one does one, right? So they, they let us know. And, um, you know, they and their pod get together and say, hey, you know, I'm working on one. And I usually have about a quarter's heads up because it takes, I mean, it takes some time to do a personal reflection. I think in our culture, we're very uncomfortable talking about ourselves. Um, and that's been a big part of this has been um, a lot of our, a lot of our work has been around helping build skills and tools around self-awareness for a system like this to work. You need to cultivate that and you need to support it with, um, with coaching, both in the teams and then in the, in the pod members themselves. Um, and, and you start from that, the principle that, you know, each of us has what we need within us, right? And you create that space for them um, to be able to do that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been pretty great. So, I mean, there are times when, when you'll have one or two a week. I think I've even had as many as two a day. Um, but yeah, there's been a lot of people who have, who've leveled up and we had such a backlog as we were working on it. It took us so much longer, so much longer to roll this out um, than I ever imagined. It took forever to do it. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a tool that allows you to see um, just to level yourself if you wanted to. You can just go and say, I'm going to level this or this. What happens if I decide to work on this skill instead of this skill? You know, I mean, you can really, you can really get it right into the nitty gritty and be like, no, I think I'm, I think I want to go from a level three to a level four in this skill. You know, how does that, how does that work on this thing? And um, you can, you can play around with that and then um, you can work with your pod and say, this is what I want to do. Or how does, you know, I might, I might want to work on these two things by, you know, going to this, you know, UX conference or going, you know, working on this, on this, this other project. So 
it it opens up these possibilities for conversation in ways that I think were difficult before, um, just because if you see such an expansive possibility, um, but you don't have a framework to hang it on, um, it um, it can be too much. Um, I'm very I'm very autodidactic, right? I'm going to teach myself whatever I need, and I'm I'm very ambitious, and so I'm just going to go out and learn and learn and learn. And learn. But um, again, when we come back to this notion of it takes all kinds of people. Um, for a company to be successful. I don't want a company of all people like me, um, even if I could find them um, and convince them to work with me. Like I want this company to have all kinds of people to be able to be successful and to be able to grow in the ways that are right for them. Um, so I need to be able to provide appropriate scaffolding um, so that folks can feel supported wherever they are and that folks wherever they are can um, can be standing on that scaffolding and collaborating together, seeing eye to eye um, on that project or um, in that way and know how to how to work together. So that's, I mean, fundamentally what what this bias, all the kind of notions of bias disruption, you know, really are about is, you know, it, it needs to not be about how I think about this tool or what would make the right project manager. We say, look, these are the skills that you need. And here's the ways that I've demonstrated them, or here's the way that others have experienced them. So you, you kind of incorporate um, the roundness of, of everyone's experiences into a shared narrative. Mm, that's really beautiful. So you mentioned uh, people find it uncomfortable to talk about themselves. Um, and I wanna zoom out a little bit because I wanna ask you about you, just for one question. You're a pretty courageous leader to take on things like this and to try things and, and do them differently. And having pretty much worked your entire career here, what gives you the gumption? Like, how do you have that kind of courage? What do you stand on that, that lets you walk through those moments of butterflies and do the radical thing anyway? I don't know how not to. <laughs> it's very, so like I said, I think it's very infuriating or very frustrating for the folks who work for me. Like anybody who works with me is like, could you just rein it in? Could you just nail it down? Like it's very, it's, I don't, I don't see organization in that same way. My mind works in a very non-traditional kind of like, way. Um, I, I tend to describe it as if, if you're, for those who are technical on the, on the podcast, like a lot, I think a lot of people's minds, as I understand it, like are more like um, a relational database. They, they have information. They like, they put the structures together and they have mappings where things fit. And for me, my mind just stores everything kind of flat, like a Mongo database. <laughs> And I can just search it really fast. And I see connections between things really fast. Um, and so it's very frustrating for others if they're like, could you just maybe not for right now? <laughs> um, and so when I see a connection or have learned a new thing, um, I want to put it into practice. I'm like, that's cool. They're like, Maybe could we just keep it not changing for a minute? Um, so I think not changing is a lot harder for me than changing, if that makes sense. Because <laughs> I just, I don't always see the structures that are there. I don't always appreciate what's what's valuable about the structures to others. So for me, th that's my blind spot. Uh, and that's the thing why I realized that um, I needed this scaffolding and I needed this structure wasn't really for me. Um, it was for others so that they could be successful, so that they could know what those possibilities were in a way that felt safe for them. I love it. I had a feeling that was uh, close to your answer because it just, I don't know, it sounds like a wild heart to me. I feel like a lot of people listening probably were going, yep, check, check, check. I can relate to that. <laughs> um, so 
related, this is the final question of the interview, quote unquote, that I've been asking everybody this season. Um, there are a lot of different listeners that we have that, that tune in. And I'd love to hear from you when you heard the title of the podcast, which is obviously Wild Hearts at Work. What did that mean to you? What came to mind when you heard that title? I think for me, it was just, it was about com people who lead with compassion and empathy and, and fundamentally don't check their humanity at the door. And so that's, for me, one of the most important things is that um, we have to recognize that we um, don't live to work. You know what I mean? We work to live. Um, so because it constitutes so much of the waking time that, that we choose to do, it needs to not suck. <laughs> so <laughs> let's make it better. And let's, let's do it with more compassion. Let's do it with more empathy and let's make it more accessible to more people. And let's do it in a way that helps as many of us reach our potential as possible. And to put my, you know, to, to appeal to those who think that I'm just, you know, completely woo, -woo out there. I actually think that's how we maximize the, the, the potential, like the, the GDP potential of, of any kind of economy um, is by helping most, you know, as many people as possible reach their potential. And by not doing it, we're, we're leaving money on the table for everybody. Mic drop. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, it's been really interesting and, and beautiful to ask that question of our guests because I think everyone has a different answer, which is amazing. Love that. Talk about like diversity of a perspective. And that allows all of us to see ourselves, you know, in one way or another in the idea of being wild hearted at work. Um, so with that, Tiffany, um, if folks are interested in maybe partnering with or learning more about Palantir.net or you, where can they find you? Where can they reach the company, et cetera, et cetera? Well, thank you. Um, so we are Palantir.net, um, not the other Palantir. So don't be confused. You can find me on Twitter at Ferris, F-A-R-R-I-S-S. -S. You can find us on Twitter at, at Palantir. That's P-A-L-A-N-T-I-R. Um, but yeah, reach out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, Tiffany. It's just been a joy getting to know you in general. And then I always love bringing my friends onto the podcast so they can hear what we talk about because we have cool conversations. So thank you for what you're doing in the world and how you're showing up because it makes a difference to all of us. Thank you for having me. And you, my dear wild hearts, thank you for coming back for another week. Or if this is your first time, thanks for showing up this week. Uh, once again, you can find us at www.wildheartsatwork.com if you'd like to look at our previous episodes. Uh, we do have a Patreon if you'd like to support the show. And I have to just add, I just released my website, www.melissaboggs.com. If you are interested in leveling up your organization and trying some crazy things not dissimilar to what Tiffany is talking about, we have a lot in common, um, reach out to me. I'd love to help you and your organization uh, level up and be ready for the future of work because it's here. It has arrived. Uh, until next time, dear hearts, say it with me. Stay wild. <laughs>